Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to the latest episode of Vinyl and Vision. Here we are with episode 123. Today's very special guest is Matt Martinez. Before I start to describe who my guest is and uh, what we are discussing tonight, I'd just like to say thank you very much for uh, being here with me and tuning in. Uh, I am actually uh, in this week that the, this, really, this episode is being released. I am celebrating my, or not celebrating, I am acknowledging my fifth year anniversary uh, doing this podcast, um, which I didn't think was ever going to happen. Never thought about it, really. <laughs> but uh, yeah, here we are five years later uh, at episode 123. Uh, I've not been very, I've never ever been very consistent uh, to keeping to a schedule. That is my own doing. It's my own fault. It's because I'm a one man operation here. I don't, it's not like I have to rely on anybody to, to you know, help me do these things. Um, but uh, pretty cool, pretty cool that I've made it this far, I think. Um, and we have more in store already. We already have some stuff lined up. Took a bit of a break here since my last episode till now. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for, for joining me. Today's guest is Matt Martinez. So Matt is a uh, musician, bassist from Phoenix, Arizona. He is currently in a band called Common Wounds. They have a new album coming out called All Night Blood. It's coming out October 18th, 2024. Um, it is currently in pre-order status for vinyl. There are three different variants that I saw that look fucking cool and amazing. Uh, I'm looking forward to picking up my own copy. Uh, you go to allnightblood.com and you will lead you to the link tree of theirs where you can find everything <clears throat> related to this release. Uh, it's coming out f- with uh, coming out on protagonist music which uh, this is actually going to be Protagonist Music's 100th release. So congratulations to them as well. That is also a pretty uh, astounding landmark for uh, any uh, independent label. And uh, they're doing good work because these these vinyl pressings look pretty fucking fabulous. And from what Matt has described to me in our conversation as far as like what will be included in that package, as far as you know the artwork is concerned, it sounds pretty cool. Common Wounds and, and this album uh, in particular, All Night Blood, uh, they're they're a heavy rock band. <clears throat> Some, you may consider them a noise rock band, but that's not far off. That's not incorrect. Um, Matt's d- choice for an album to discuss was Drive Like Jehu's Yank Crime. Um, I have never gotten into that album well. Okay, I, I don't think my brain, I think my brain was too soft when I first heard that record that I just didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't compute, okay? Um, the, but it's definitely uh, something that I can get into now. I definitely, certainly appreciate it at this point in my life. And I think it's a fantastic fucking record. Uh, there's so much good stuff about it. Um, as far as research is concerned, very difficult to find things about this album. But, uh, you know, I did the best that I could as for with the information given, and I think that Matt and I had a great conversation, and I'm very thankful for it, and I hope you enjoy it too. If you do, please do all the things you do with the internet. Like, share, subscribe, comment, rate, review is what we say here. Uh, those all help immensely, and, uh, and considering it's my 50th anniversary, please do. Okay, as a, as a little birthday gift to me, could you just... Uh, you know, rate and review, just put the five-star review on it, uh, or be honest, whatever. If you don't like it, put it fucking three stars. I don't care. Just do it. That'd be great. And it's just a nice little favor for me. Thank you very much. Um, You can also visit our website, psychicstatic.net is what it is. And, uh, you know, if you want to help me out in a financial way, just make a purchase there. Okay, I have records for sale. I have links to my eBay store. I have releases that I put out uh, from other local bands, uh, Hammer Party and Narnia, and uh, would like to keep on doing that. So if you make a purchase, I can continue, and I'd appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much, folks. Enjoy. Matt Martinez, nice to meet you. Great to meet you. Just to right off the bat, the topic of discussion was going to be Drive Like Jay Who's Yank Crime, and uh, it turned out to be pretty difficult to find, to do research on that album. Yeah, and when when Kern presented, you know, this opportunity, I, I, I started thinking of impactful records, mm-hmm. and I tried to find something that both resonated throughout my musical life, and was available because a lot of a lot of the 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 records that i'm like oh this this had a huge impact 
in my youth or in my teen years or whatnot, wiped from the internet, no information. And then that, that kind of leads to a dead end conversation. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I, I would have, and would have done my best to, to, to do what I could, uh, obviously if I can't find the material to listen to at all, that would really put me at a disadvantage. Yes. Um, but you know, Drive Like Jehu, I mean, that's like, they're like a, a pretty sizable band, you know? I mean, they certainly have had an impact. I think that they are very well known for being like an indie or an underground band. Um, this album specifically, I was just like really hopeful because I was just like, oh, well, at least that album is on the internet. I know I'll be able to find it on the other, you know, I know I'll be able to listen to it. Um, but, uh, but as far as like, you know, interviews with that band are, is concerned, they don't speak about this album in depth. No, and, and at the time, I mean, for being a major label release, there wasn't a lot of press, um, you know, that, and this is back in the day where pre-internet, we were scouring magazines, looking for anything, looking for video interviews, um, right. content, you know, that, that kind of content that we, we now usually have at, the, at our tips or our fingertips uh, just wasn't there. It, was, it, was, it created a lot of mystery. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, let's see, this album came out in 94, right? 1994. So, uh, how old were you in 94? I was 18 years old. I was just graduating high school when this came out. Um, I think right before I graduated, I think was the when I saw them on the tour supporting this album. Oh, okay. So you got to see them in 94. Yes. I, I saw them twice. So, so I, I latched on to them and a lot of the, the the bands that were on their previous label, Cargo Head Hunter, which was a San Diego-based label. Um, Drive Like J.U., I think, was the first band that I was turned on to on that label. And, you know, bec because of, again, that lack of information, we would look at the back of record covers and say, oh, if it's on this label, maybe I'll like other bands on this label. And it started with their self-titled and I latched onto a lot of bands from that scene. Um, so I saw them, the first time I saw them was probably 92, 93. It was a show with Drive Like Jehu, J Church, who was also a very impactful band for me, Bay Area melodic punk band, um, Tanner, which was Gar from Hot Snakes band, um, and Digits. And it was at a skate park. It was it was it blew my mind, and I was I was completely into that self titled LP. When they played, they played mostly new material that wasn't even released yet. So it was like it was overwhelming. It wasn't familiar. That made me a little uncomfortable, which yeah. was awesome. You know, it made it made you want more of these. These little hooks got caught in your mind. Um, yeah, and just really created a lot of a lot more of that that mystique. Okay, and so this was ninety four. This is the first time you saw them. That that first time was probably ninety late ninety two, early ninety three. Oh, okay. And then okay. and then when they released then when they released Yank Crime, I saw them in ninety four on that support tour. And what was that show like? That show was at a small bar. Um, it was an all it ended up being an all ages show, and Tanner supported, and then there was a local support uh, called Teeth, and they were a band from Tucson. Um, and it was a great show. It was very loud. It was very packed. Um, I think at that point there was a, a lot more momentum and, and underground hype and a lot of kids came out. Yeah. Okay. Um, and wait, so this, and this was where? This was at, uh, this was at a, a bar in Phoenix called, uh, the Mason jar at the time. And it was oh. like a glam metal bar, um, that, that did some punk shows and some other indie type shows. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, it was a very, uh, intimate setting. Hmm. Okay, cool. So wait, so, um, you said Phoenix, uh, you were in Phoenix now, correct? Yeah, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm born and raised and been here, been here nonstop. Oh, okay. All right. So, so the times you've seen them have always been in Phoenix. It was the, the first time was in Mesa, which is one of our suburbs at a oh, skate park okay. and then Phoenix the second time. Okay. So, um, so speaking of, of being born and raised in Phoenix, uh, what was, what was that like, you know, being raised in Phoenix? Uh, what was, uh, what was it like in the household? I mean, it, it was, it was great, you know, had the, had the nuclear family, um, 
dad was ex-military. You know, we had the the suburban VA HUD home. Um, very, very typical. Um, we, we lived in a small suburb that was, it's part of Phoenix, but it, it was on the edge of town. And that was that was always the idea. Move to the edge of town. That's where the, the newest builds are happening. That's where the newest communities are being built. Um, yeah. As I grew up and through high school, um, that part of town kind of shifted a, a lot of gang activity, drive-by shootings in the 90s. Um, and from there, once I graduated high school, I ended up moving to Tempe, Arizona, which is where Arizona State University is located. Um, didn't move there to go to college necessarily. I moved there to uh, be involved in, with other musicians and uh, where, where a lot of things were happening. And it was, it was very acceptable to to network with other musicians and, and form bands and go on tour. Yeah. Well, so what was uh, what was music like for you as a kid in that in that house? My parents were not very musical. They 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 would have fit well in this generation where it's very single driven rather than album driven. So they they didn't latch on to specific bands and be like, I need to have everything in their catalog. They played a lot of oldies, fifties, sixties rock and roll. Um, I remember them having. We'd, we'd, we'd go on road trips and, and listen to tapes that they had. I, I remember they had a Queen tape, Eddie Rabbit, Statler Brothers, mm. uh, Freddie Fender, just kind of all across the board, which which was interesting. Nobody in my family, immediate or, you know, connected to aunts, uncles. Nobody was a musician. Nobody played instruments. Um, mm. I I loved it. I You know, I... I think I navigated through kids I met in elementary school to skateboarding, which the natural progression was Thrasher Magazine, mm. which introduced me to punk rock and heavy metal. Um, I, I would say my my first gateway was all, you know a lot of skate rock, punk rock bands, Misfits, Black Flag, things like that. But then that that naturally progressed to Metallica in the in the mid eighties, okay. and that that was what drove me. I was like, you know, this is, I want to play bass. I, Cliff Burton, I connect with this and I beg my parents, I want to play bass. I want to play bass. And they're like, you, you won't stick with it. Um, and then they, eventually they gave in, got me a bass and uh, I took lessons for a while. And my teacher was a eighties glam metal dude. And the first thing he said is you, you like all this punk rock stuff. He said, Just start a band. You're going to learn more playing with other people than mm. you are by studying theory and learning how to shred um mm. okay. which may have been bad advice and i've i've spent years going through and trying to correct bad habits um for instance because he he was he, he was like just learn to play with a pick picks are cool you know playing punk stuff like it, it works so I, ne I never developed like a traditional finger style bass playing until later in life i, I i've met i've messed around with that but i'm still dominantly a pick player so yeah. it's that, it's that good foundation that that set the narrative of my musical journey, but it definitely wasn't um, a scholarly journey, I guess. Sure. Well, I mean, did you really ever, uh, you know, continue on with your musical education, and, and like, you know, did you follow sporadically? And you know, I, I started I in college. I started taking some music classes, but then it really never made sense to me for a career. Yeah. And at that point I was paying for college tuition and I was like, you know, probably oh, yeah. not worth pursuing music if I'm not going to be a music teacher or, you know, get involved in, you know, intense, you know, studio musicianship or anything like that. Um, oh. But yeah. Okay. But so, so you followed this advice and you started a band. Yes. Yeah, immediately that? found found kids that played music similar or somewhat similar. Um, I went to Catholic school. I went to a really small school. My graduating class was probably 40 people. Oh. So finding people that were into, quote unquote, alternative cultures um, was difficult. And uh, so, so you end up latching on to kids that have adjacent interests, interests 
which was great because I was playing in bands with kids that introduced me to a lot of gothic rock and um, other kids that were heavy into, you know, a lot of alternative music and, or death metal. Um, it, it was a really good experience, you know, like being kind of forced to work within the, the confines of your environment. Like, okay, we're all stuck here. We're all kind of the outsiders. Let's just try and make this work. Um, so yeah, in, in high school, I, I formed some bands that were, you know, fun, but not, not there, not productive. Um, didn't really know what we were doing. Just kind of, you know, uh, took the DIY course very seriously of, you know, okay, well, there's really no rules. Let's just kind of uh, have fun with it and see where it goes. Um, you said this was high school? That was in high school. Yeah. That's, that's my first started playing in bands that played shows and got involved with DIY punk scene, um, met other bands, got exposed to a lot of other music and just kind of, it kind of just snowballed from there into, you know, this world that I can't escape. Right. Wait, okay. But so we do starting high school, starting this, these bands. Uh, so I'm assuming this is around like 1990. Yeah. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, we made a bit of a little bit of a jump there. So like from, from when you were growing up as a kid with your parents in the house and being exposed to like their tape collection, which was, you know, mostly a lot of that fifties rock stuff, Stylin' Brothers and Freddie Fender, I think you said, and stuff like that. Like um, where, like, where did you start? Like, when, when do you think it was that you started getting interested in music? Was it that stuff that kind of turned you on and then you kind of went on and found your own stuff or what? No, I, I really think it was it was skateboarding introduced me to punk rock, which was in the 80s. That was probably like 85, 84, 85. Yeah. Um, well, so how did that, know, was that introduction? Like who introduced you to skateboarding or, or Thrasher magazine? The kids in the neighborhood. Kids in the neighborhood were, were skateboarding. I got a skateboard. Yeah. We we hung out. We read Thrasher magazine. It was like, okay, well, this is this is the, the uniform. This is this is what we listened to, okay. and you just kind of latch on to it. Oh, okay. So there's kids in the neighborhood. Did you have siblings at all that were interested? No, I, I have a sister, and she is the furthest removed from anything in this world. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Uh, younger or older? She is a year younger than me. Okay, so you guys were close, but not, not like connected and freely correct yeah yeah close in age but but definitely and the, the more and more my my musical taste and involvement in a music scene increased um i would say our relationship definitely never connected right. um yeah. she didn't understand why i was doing all these things and not having just a quote-unquote normal life right right yeah well so and, and what was that do you think i mean because like I mean, and these kids introducing you to, to punk rock culture and to Thrasher magazine uh, as a young kid, I'm assuming somewhere around 12, right? Yeah, 10 to, 10 to 12, probably. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty young. Yeah. Um, and, you know, tra making tapes for each other, tra trading, passing along tapes and, and whatnot. Um, I mean, there, there was just something, I don't know if it was defiance. You know, I, I, I mean, obviously there's in any kind of, subculture counterculture there's there's that sense of, of defiance and rebellion um but there was something about the music i just connected with and mm -hmm. and when i kind of put together that anybody could make that art and share that art yeah. it, it, it kind of made started making more and more sense and that was probably around 12 or 13 was when i started understanding oh i could play in a band I could learn an instrument and probably make this happen. It might not be great, but I could probably, you know, yeah. piece this together. <laughs> right. So it was like 12 or 13 that you picked up the bass? It was 13 when I picked up the bass. Um, okay. And then probably by 14, probably, you know, within a, within a year of practicing and taking lessons, I, I felt enough confidence to try and play with people hmm. and kind of just uh, dove into that. Okay. And why bass? Cliff Burton. I mean, Metallica, that was, that, that was, it was, there was something that just gravitated to me that this is my instrument. This is what I'm going to play. Yeah. I don't know if I understood it. I don't know if I understood where it fit in the band at the time. Right. Um, and also maybe being so tall. I mean, by, by the time I was in junior high, I was at least six feet tall. 
Um, and I was like, oh, this is the bigger instrument that fits me. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so it, it could have been just a physical attraction to the bass. Sure, sure. But I mean, Cliff Burton, I mean, that's that's massive sound, you know? I mean, like, he really kind of cut through those early Metallica records and, like, you know, he would, like, solo. So it's just, like, he yeah. kind of, uh, like, gave you an opportunity to hear the bass, like, whereas, like, you know, I, I think when I was experiencing music as a kid, it's just, like, I barely understood, like, the, the difference between a guitar and a bass guitar, you know? It's just, like, I was just, like, well, you know, I, I think the thing that, that stuck out to me was, um, I'm a, you got a few years on me, so when I was... Uh, like 12 or 13, I think, uh, Faith No More's uh, The Real Thing came out. And mm -hmm. the song Epic was the big thing on MTV. And that's around the time that my brother, who was older than me, was uh, interested in playing music and he started already taking guitar lessons. But I, but I remember him asking me, he was just like, you know, like, what's like, like, what's a song that like you would like, like a lot? And I remember saying Epic. And he was just like, okay, well, what, like, what do you, what, what do you hear that? sounds interesting i was just like well what, what's making that sound like it goes a do -dun, do -dun, do -dun, do -dun, do -dun, yeah you know and then he was just like oh that's the bass he's like okay that's what i want to do then awesome yeah so i mean Cliff yeah Burton, no, and, I, and i and i think about that and i think about the metallica journey and i'm i'm lucky that it picked up or began for me with cliff burton because he was a very apparent in the mix bass player right had i found metallica at and justice for all there, there's barely any bass in there. Um, right. It's hard to dissect. I remember getting the the guitar, the bass tablature book for Anjustice Justice for All, trying to play along to the recording, and I was like, I, I'm lost. I can't figure this out. Mm -hmm. um, and then year, year later, I understood, oh, he was mixed down in the mix, and it's this notorious thing. But um, I think I think with a lot of like you know heavy music, yeah, bass can get lost. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that it's one of those unsung instruments where, you know, a lot of the times people don't really consider the importance of it and how it kind of fills out sound. And, you know, it depends on the band, too. I mean, like, if you're listening to, like, the Everly Brothers or something, I mean, like, I can't, I don't think I can think of any bass in those songs, you know, because it's, yeah. just, it's just so not important. But if you listen to, like, you know, some some funk and some R&B, it's like, it's very apparent. Yeah, no, it, it drives the song. And, and I think, you know, as a musician, I start, hungering for understanding those genres that I didn't necessarily embed myself with as a musician. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've definitely, I've definitely, there's been times where I've tried to dissect, you know, funk songs, disco songs, just because, just because of those bass lines drive, whether they're real or synthetic. Um, and, it, and it's, it's, it's cool. It expands, expands your mindset. Um, kind of gives you an understanding of or at least a partial understanding of where other musicians were when they were working their part into that song sure sure did you ever have any interest in playing anything else or was it always bass i i tell people i've owned guitars and i do own guitars but it's it's always been bass you don't know how to play guitar really i know how to play i know how to play basic i i i don't have like a uh, a huge, you know, chord library, like, you know, a lot, a lot of bass playing is more singular notes. And, and I understand guitar and I understand how chords stack and, and build. Um, but no, I, I just, I, ne I never wanted to be that, that, that bass player that felt like they needed to step into a real instrument and shine there you know it's 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 like a, it's like a common drummer symptom where your drummer shows up with an acoustic guitar and they're like i'm tired of being behind the drum set i want to i want to be a front person i want to be up up in the front and i've i've known many guitar players that picked up i mean many drummers that picked up guitar right. um so uh, it's it's something i was comfortable with and i was like okay i'm i'm grounded in this i i understand where i fit in the band um and as i've gotten older and played with more musicians and better drummers that connection between the bass player and the drummer you know the it, it, one day it just i played with a really good drummer and just clicked and mm -hmm. i was like okay i understand i don't understand how to play drums but i understand that interaction between their foot and my instrument um yeah. and you know I, I think that's 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 definitely important the 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 language, the unspoken language that musicians have, um, 
it's not it's not innate it's not uh it's something that you i think you learn yeah i was going to ask you something um i didn't know when it would come up but it sounds like it's now um considering you're such a devout bass player uh, i'm a bass player too and considering we were going to be talking about drive like jay who uh and gang crime specifically i think that the bass is a very big part of this album and this music mm -hmm. Um, I think that bass is obviously a very big part of your existing band, your, your current band, uh, Common Means, and the new album I have already listened to. And um, do you think you have like your own sound? Like, what do you think about? Your yeah, sound? I mean, uh, that's that's a difficult question because, <laughs> like, I don't feel that I'm you know one of those musicians that's going to go down in history um, as as like an iconic player or anything like that. Um, but I, I feel that through my experiences, I've developed a sound that feels very personal to me. Um, and it's, it's based on a lot of different influences. Some of them I think would be apparent. Um, others are, were built from just experience. Um, you know, I, I play with a lot of distortion and that comes from that world of previously playing in death metal bands. Um, there, there's something about that grit on the bass that I like. Um, but then, you know, David Sims from Jesus Lizard, highly influential, very punctuated bass lines, still having groove. And I don't think I have as much groove as him, but there's, there's, there's something about the way his bass cuts through that I, I fell in love with. Oh, yeah. Same with Bob Weston, uh, from Shellac. Um, so, you know, a lot of it was, especially with common wounds, it was uh, a lot of ideas of, of the sonic placement of everything. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, the, the set, what I heard from the band throughout us developing songs and rehearsing was this bass and drum driven song with guitars that add, even, the, even though the guitars are very dominant and, and probably the driver of the song, um, they are texture, and and kind of the balance you know they they create the they create the room they create the feel um whereas as the bass and the drums are just kind of driving everything forward um so yeah i get i get i would say yeah there 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 are some things that are, are very distinctive um i don't think there's anybody i'm outright copying yeah and i and i think that's that's an amalgamation of influence it's it's you know like i said it's the the heavy metal thing the death metal thing love of this you know the 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 noise rock stuff and just love of the instrument i mean you know we we could we could go on we we could have a whole episode just talking about bass players that influenced me and then that and it's uh it's all it's a long list it's uh right and and, so, and some that don't directly relate with what i'm currently doing right right well i mean so i mean the thing the thing that i was thinking about was because uh first of all you're surrounded by gear and i think i saw it travis beam was it bass uh this is this is an electrical guitar company uh oh. bass which it's all aluminum the, the fingerboard the body it's all hollow aluminum yeah. um the travis beam was the influence and in, in built in the 70s those are wood bodies with yeah. aluminum necks and wood fingerboards um i'm very lucky that I own one of those as well. Um, but the electrical is what I've been playing. Kevin from electrical um, was influenced by Travis Bean and started doing his own take. And now he does the authorized reissues of Travis Bean uh, guitars and basses. Oh, okay. So he's well, carrying on that lineage of machinists building instruments, um, yeah. which, which is, is, is interesting because there's something that's very, organic uh about what we know about traditional guitars and basses you know from acoustic guitars to an upright basses forward it was it was always very wooden handmade handcrafted woodworking artistry and and there's something about the aluminum that again it cuts through it it has a very very punctual defined sound um right. Once I, once I got into it, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, because like messing with your sound, like, I mean, because uh, the thing about bass is that, like, I think if you use the, the right kind of amp and just kind of turn it up, like, you'll like kind of like what guitarists will say about a Marshall is like, if you just like 
you don't even need a distortion pedal if you just like crank it right and you just kind of like let those natural freaking tones kind of take over so i mean like do you mess with your sound as far as like pedals are concerned or, or like you know equalizers or anything like that um so i uh, a few years ago i went into the world of uh modeling profiling units i use a line six helix as my as my preamp so that that unit it models a multitude of amps and effects units um so i build everything in the in the quote unquote in the box in the in the effects unit and then feed that into a power amp into the speakers so it's a little synthetic um the technology is pretty insane um sure. so i you know the the model I run for my base amp it's a, it's a Galian Kruger, very uh, you know eight hundred RB very you know tried and true base amp and that's the foundation of the tone. Yeah. Um, I I do I do use a fuzz pedal in front of that, but in general not a lot of effects. I I, I still I one hundred percent agree with you that you know there's there's something magical about just plugging in a standard instrument into a good amp that sounds great with the right player. Um, hmm. one thing I really learned, and, and this is from working in music stores and with music companies, um, so much of that sound is in that player's hands. You know, awesome. I've, I've, I've seen world-class hmm. musicians pick up a, an expensive practice amp and a, a student level guitar and play and sound close to their albums and so it's it's i'm like there's something magical in those hands they're they're the way they attack that instrument um well, I think that's true i mean like uh i think i made the comparison because i was doing research on don caballero right mm -hmm. and che the drummer i remember watching a video of him playing and i was watching him play b8 hi-hats and yeah. it's like those are the worst hi-hats you can buy <laughs> cheapest they suck you know but like that's what he uses and he's been using right along and i was just like well there you go it's the player it's not the instrument you know very very true so that's cool okay well yeah so i just i just wanted to kind of think about that a little bit because uh obviously bass is very important to this record obviously it's very important to you i think that your sound is very good actually i mean like you know i listened to your uh, previous ep as well as the new record and uh and it sounds great you know thank I think, you uh, i think you do a good job i i think you know it's 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 a struggle because i think the the gearhead mentality is always at conflict to me with that you don't need good, great gear to be a great musician and i i 100 believe that um i feel privileged that I, I was able to acquire some interesting instruments and and gear um, but is it necessary? No. And if things changed and I was playing through a P bass through, you know, a good loud clean amp, we'll, we'll make it work. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, because like that, that that punchiness that you're talking about, like that almost like kind of metallic, you know, kind of like what you're yeah. like, like the Jesus lizard, you know, it's just like you kind of have to have something that's going to emulate that that harsh tone to it. I mean, like I think, I, I think it helps. I think it helps tremendously. <laughs> Yeah, but there's there's something that that you use obviously that kind of makes it kind of kind of cut through a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so, punk rock in middle school, let's call it. Uh, mm -hmm. Get turned out to Metallica. So, how does Drive Like Jehu come into the picture? When when I entered high school, I was that that confused mess of influence you know i i remember the first day of, of school in one of my classes the teacher had everybody introduce themselves said give your name and your favorite favorite musician and right. i said my favorite bands are jane's addiction and napalm death and everybody's like i don't know what you're talking about um so it was already it was already eclectic in, in the things i was interested in but then I mean, I meet a kid and he's like, Jane's Addiction, I love them. And we start talking about music. He's like, have you heard this band? Have you heard this band? And it, again, it came into more, you know, trading CDs, trading tapes, um, oh. and started a band with with this, this person. Um, it was very floppy punk rock. Um, and had another friend who 
um, ended up starting like a DIY record label. And he started flooding us with all these other things that, hey, check this out, check this out. And I think a lot of it was Nirvana related because, you know, we, we, we were truly young teens when that explosion happened. You know, I think, I think I, I heard Bleach and a friend was like, they have a new record coming out. This band's crazy. They're, they're really, they're really good. And, and, you know, and, and whatnot. And then, and then the whole nevermind explosion happened. What happened is, is I think some of the, some of these other kids started digging deeper. Oh, Nirvana did this split with the Jesus lizard. I need to check out this band. Uh, Kurt Cobain was talking about the Melvins. I need to check this out. So we start, we started finding all these bands and it was, you know, it was all punk rock to us. Um, we, we didn't, we didn't have necessarily the, the, the genre definers that we have now. Um, I think, I think it was my friend, Jeremy Yoakum that, that turned me on to that. That's the gentleman that, that ran the record label. Um, turned me on to dry Lake Jehu with their, their self-titled, um, and it, it just immediately connected to it. There, there was something about that band that wasn't as primitive as Nirvana or anything Nirvana adjacent. It, it wasn't as simple as punk rock or hardcore. It, it, it there was something complex about it. You know, there there were a lot of inter, there was a lot of interplay between the guitars, um, this angular sense of of the guitars speaking back and forth, and and it was it was. One of those things where I was like, I don't know if I could ever play like this. I don't know how they do this, and, and it, it it really expanded my uh, my perception of w- what could be done musically without mm-hmm. being like Steve Vai or you know some sort of shred music. Yeah, um, but it but it also had that complexity. Yeah, I mean, I I've never been a very big fan of Drive Like Jehu. I mean, I. I heard about them like a long time ago and i remember trying to listen to some of the music i think i started with the ink crime and I, I don't know if i got it immediately i was just like okay it's cool it's interesting um but i didn't really give it a good listen because this mm-hmm. this one is particularly uh textured which i think i missed all of the texture i think i heard yes. most of the screaminess i think i heard most of the kind of like you know aggressive driving guitars but i definitely did not grasp anywhere onto the idea that the, this is a album that kind of was a predecessor to emo you know or was associated to emo in any way yeah no I, and I, I think i think it ultimately was um and with yank crime the songs are really long yeah so right. i i think i think which was interesting for a major label debut there there's there's really only a couple songs that are in that four minute or less format. So that's why, you know, music videos weren't getting made or played and songs weren't getting played on the radio. Yeah. Um, so there, there, maybe, you know, maybe that was from a professional standpoint, self-defeating. Um, and maybe for the, the first time listener, it's a little overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they actually, they worked that into their contract. They, they didn't want to be uh, beholden to like, uh, be obligated to make uh, music videos. Okay. I don't know if that like is informed why they wrote songs as long as they did. I think that something else had to, uh, you know, kind of inspired that. But uh, but they were definitely like anti kind of music corporation thing. Even though they signed the, the deal with Interscope, uh, they definitely did not want to make video- music videos. <clears throat> yeah, but, and at the time it seemed like Interscope was very interested in throwing art out there yeah and 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 i i i also heard that they uh they didn't have any interscope didn't have any creative input to the record Mm -hmm. you know because a lot of times we hear those horror stories of a and r people getting involved and rewrites and songwriters coming in and and destroying an album right yeah they didn't have any they they the the contract they worked out was like unheard of you know like uh complete uh, creative control, mm-hmm. no uh, no input from the label at all. Like they handed them the record done with all the artwork, and it was just like that's it. That it is what it is. So, um, but I, I didn't know the first record either, you know. And like, I actually I spoke with uh, Justin Pearson. Yes. And he 
he didn't choose the first Dre Jehu album, but he definitely mentioned how that was a very important record to him. And then, and only now, to prepare to speak with you, did I listen to that first album in its entirety. And I was just like, this is very pop compared to Yank Crime. You know, there's like a, yes. there's a lot of real pop elements in here. I mean, it's still got a lot of the same thing. It's still got a lot of like, you know, Rick's kind of screaming vocals and it's got a lot of aggression and it's fast. Um, but it's not like this. Yeah, no, they, they were definitely, it was, it was definitely an evolution. Um, I think a lot of the people that were fans of the first LP took a while to warm up to Yank Crime. Um, because it, it was it was an evolution, but there was you know and 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 I, I come from similar world that Justin did, and you know there there was that there was hardcore and punk DNA in in Drive Like Jehu, and the band that that uh, Rick and and John Reese did before, which was Pitchfork, you know there, there was definitely some so a lot of punk rock and hardcore influence or adjacentness. Um, that that resonated it was like oh these people are our people they're they 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 come from the same scene they're just doing something a little different interesting okay well yeah i I thought i thought that was strange um so i do i I do appreciate you choosing this album because i I really needed to listen to it i really i you know knowing it now like listening to it now there is definitely things about it that i i missed in the past and i'm really thankful that i can hear them now um and i can hear uh, obviously thank you for choosing this album because i am i from what you're telling me obviously you could have chosen something that could have been way harder to get into <laughs> but uh but uh, this but this album i mean uh i didn't expect it to be this difficult to find stuff on um so i think it's because um rick Rober, you know he seemed to be kind of uh private you know he kind of seemed to not want to shed too much light on like what songs were about or anything like that definitely definitely and you know i don't even know if up until recently especially digging into this record i don't know how familiar i was with all of the lyrics there were pieces i would pull out but he's got this drawl to his voice that sometimes it's it's you're going to misinterpret lyrics um and and when i looked at, at some of the the actual printed lyrics um it was it was pretty cool it was it was it was seeing it from a, again a different perspective yeah okay so so you did a little bit of your own research on this album yeah i was like i was like you know i'm familiar with this this record i've been listening to to it for years fairly consistently i would say that this is one of those records that's never left my rotation mm-hmm. um but a lot of times that becomes passive listening and you know you're you're so familiar with it and so comfortable with it you don't you don't question it or challenge anything and um it's you know i think it's the same thing if you were to ever sit down with an instrument and learn another artist's music and pick things apart you mm-hmm. start hearing things differently you start you start understanding things differently um and and yeah so so to me in digging in and and revisiting the lyrics while I was listening gave it another dimension. Um, you know, I think there were a lot of one liners and songs that, that really resonated with me um, or just stuck in my brain. But then when I, when I, when I listened to, a, a, listened to it while reading along, uh, his lyrics were very crafty. The, the, the use of metaphor, the use of, you know, is he singing about this or is he singing about something else? You know? Mm. Um, yeah. It's very strange. And, and I like that. I like interpretation. I like I like when I think there's there's a necessary component to music for some music to be very straightforward. And then I especially from a lyrical standpoint, but then I also think that there's that more complex lyric writing that leaves so much to listener interpretation. Sure. It's like any good art really, you know. I mean yeah. interpretation is is kind of the best part about it is that you kind of make it your own. Definitely, definitely. But I think there's also that that importance for, I have one agenda. This is, a, a, you know, especially with like political music, protest music, it's like, you're straight to the point. And, and, and that's, that's important in its own world. It's just a different type of art. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's art with purpose, and then there's there's art for art's sake. I guess you could say. Correct. Yeah, I dig it. I dig it all. You know, it just depends on how you feel. One hundred percent. So, like, uh, getting into this band, I, I kind of want to start. You know, getting into what I kind of came up with about this album, but um, but I also don't want to skip over your musical history too much. You know, and we haven't really talked about a lot of that because um, uh, I know that you mentioned Metallica earlier. Uh, as being like a you know primary influence on you and you but you actually had an experience with them with one of your previous bands right yes so so the band i was in for the majority of the mid 2000s was a band called landmine marathon um we were a death metal band um made up of all punk kids uh hardcore scene kids um and we we built up a lot of momentum and a lot of uh uh media interest and that kind of came to a crowning moment when we got a call from Metallica that they were curating a festival in Atlantic City called the Orion Fest and that James Hetfield had requested we play. So the, the festival was a two-day festival. The entire roster of the festival was curated by the band. Every yeah. member of the band picked a few, a few, a handful of bands and this, this festival came together. It was, it was in an airfield in Atlantic City. Um, pretty insane i mean when we talk about full circle moments yeah. you know how does that happen you know how 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 does this this punk rock kid that's maybe a little self doubtful about their abilities as a musician yeah uh get to the point of playing with that that band that was the entry point right right i mean and how did that happen like, like i mean you're saying james had to call you guys but how did he get a hold of, of uh, the album or the, the music um i think because there was a media momentum at that point. Um, we had some other fans that were connected to them. Hmm. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, that somebody that had previously worked with them put him in the loop. Uh, yeah. Put him in the loop and, and turn, uh, turn uh, him on to us. I don't <laughs> know how big of a fan he was, but enough to, to say, enough. hey, we want this on the fest. Yeah, that's pretty great. That's pretty awesome. So did you get to, to them? I didn't. I was running around all day trying to do the the media junket because so at that fest they they had you doing all these different interviews, radio. It it was it was pretty intense. My guitar player got and drummer got to meet James. Um I ended up standing next to Lars at one point, but didn't engage him. Yeah, and it's that balance of like, I don't want to be that that guy. I don't want right. yeah. <laughs> although. Uh, uh, and and related to this uh, conversation, another artist on the bill was Hot Snakes. Oh, cool! And the day before we both played, I ran into them at the uh, there was an artist section with food and and drinks, and I was standing right behind uh, Rick, and I had long hair at the time, you know, wearing death metal shirts and and whatnot, and. Uh, I, I pull him aside. I'm like, Hey, I just wanted to let you know that you're one of the reasons I play music. And he was taken aback. He, it's like, it's hard to connect. You see this obvious metal dude. Yeah. How did, how did this happen? And then we, we talked a little bit and he's like, Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. Um, so, so it was like a full circle moment upon a full circle moment that I got to at least stay my peace to, to an artist that, that influenced me. Um, hopefully not in a cringy fanboy way. And it, be, it becomes more meaningful in reflection when, you know, obviously he recently passed. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. So it's, it's like, it's like, I guess, I guess, I guess my, my takeaway is if you have somebody that affected your life, talk to them, you know, if, yeah. if you have that chance, say something. Right. Just try not to be blubbery. Just be really matter of fact. It's like I really dig exactly. you. Exactly, and it was a short conversation. It was it was a couple minutes. It wasn't. It wasn't. Hey, come back to my van. I want to talk to you more. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, I know. I, I I hear you. I mean, I'm I'm sure it was cool. Um, he seems like a cool guy. You know, uh, or he seems like he was a cool guy. But uh, but that's great. It was such a great experience for you. And then like how how fortunate too. It's like that. Not only did you get that, but you know, invite by Metallica to to play their festival. But then to also run into another one of your idols. Yeah. Uh, no, it was it was it was a crazy kind of a whirlwind weekend. Um and yeah, I, I can't I, I'm very grateful that that 
everything fell into place with that. Yeah. Um, you think uh, you think maybe you'll send uh, send Metallica the new record from uh, Common Common Wounds? You know, I I always feel uncomfortable with with pushing it on on friends. Sure. Or and I wouldn't say they're friends, but, but people I, I have like a, a a connection or some sort of you know some sort of connection with. Yeah. Do you want to push the limits of that relationship by you know injecting? business you know i i have i have a couple friends that that have been successful in music mm-hmm. and it's always you know it usually happens organically where, where things get where they need to be I, yeah. I don't try to push things like hey you know i know you're successful can you take a listen to this right um but yeah it, 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 if it happens it, it usually happens on its own okay well that's good i mean obviously it did happen in the past I, I, I wish you the best for it regardless. I hope that it does make it to the hands of uh, the appropriate channels that can, you know, do something like that, uh, you know, something similar to that in the future. Um, Cause it's a great album, you know, I mean, and, and like, I know what you, I know what you're saying. Like, it's always, you know, you, you feel like an idiot trying to be like that, that shameless self promoter, but at the same time, like in this business, right. Like you kind of have to be, you know, like, yeah. And it's that, that conflict between oh, I'm an artist and, Oh, this, there's some, there's a business aspect to it. Right. And, you know, there, there's commitment to selling records and trying to recoup, you know, the expense, yeah. but then there's also, there's also, you know, and maybe this is how I justify it to myself um, in the marketing side of things is I just want people to hear the music. I want, I want, I want somebody to be a, to connect to what we're doing and take something away from it. Um, you know, and then that's more important to me than selling records than success or or whatnot that to me that's the success right. um well, you know and, and if somebody if somebody hears our record and a young a young person hears the record and decides to start playing music i, I would love to be a part of that you know I, yeah. I would love to be one of those people that's a catalyst for somebody to create on their own right right absolutely i mean and and even better you know than like you know the kind of shameless self-promotion route is it's like just prove it right prove it yourself yeah. Start doing, you know, you guys do shows. You guys are going to go on tour, probably. Just go out there and prove it every night, and then that's that's all the justification you need, right? Exactly. Right. Okay. All right. Well, then let's uh, let's do this. Let's get into uh, Drive Like Jay, who's Yank Crime. Awesome. So the first fact I found out was that uh, the band named itself after a, a passage from the Bible. Yes. Um, which I was not familiar with. Uh, the passage is from Two Kings nine twenty. I don't know, and uh, and the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. <laughs> and 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 for me, like having that Catholic school background, it was like it was interesting because I knew it wasn't. They weren't a, a religious band, and yeah. I wasn't a religious person. Um, but I liked that that obscure reference, you know. But yeah, that's that's a that's an interesting. You know, it's like, oh, are are they religious? Or are they just you know finding something interesting in a in a historical book? Right, right. I mean, and well, so that so you were actually already interpreting it. I mean, like you you knew the passage, or like you knew the reference. I didn't know the passage. Um, I th- I think it's one of those just like shared knowledge telephone games uh, back then, pre-internet. You know, somebody was like, oh yeah, it's from the Bible, but yeah. then. You know, like a lot of their artwork had trains. They had a T-shirt with a train on it, um, and I was like, "Drive like Jehu was was Jehu uh, a train operator?" You know, you start creating these own these stories, and kids say, "Oh no, it was this, it was this," and yeah. and somebody figured out, "Oh, it's from the Bible." Right. Okay. Oh, all right. So I didn't know if, if your your Christian uh, Catholic school upbringing, like if you had made like if it was uh, introduced to you or at some other point. If so, if so, if went right out the in one ear out the other sure as as the rest of the education does it's just get you know, got to make room got to make room in the, in the computer just get rid of all this stuff yeah exactly so, uh, so that's like where drive like ju comes from like where where does uh common wounds come from so that that's that's one of those you know interpretation names um i i thought i i, I always thought it could be interpreted on two levels one being common shared wounds, like we all have emotional wounds and damages that we're dealing with. And there's a little sense of community 
in that we share that struggle. Yeah. But then the other is common wounds, like, oh, that's just a common wound. That's, you know, just a, a knife cut. That's a common wound. Um, so I, I, I thought it worked on both those levels. I, I thought it's something that, you know, I, I think lyrically we, we try to go from the, the personal side of things. Um, so, you know, the, that, that first interpretation probably rings most true. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I will recommend to anybody, do not Google search common wounds without adding <laughs> band as the pictures are pretty disturbing and uh, just not what you're looking for. And I think that's always considered at this point is number one, is the band name already taken? Oh, yeah. Whether it be a successful band or someone else that recorded a demo, you don't want to necessarily step on those toes. And then number two, is it searchable? A yeah. lot of band names are not searchable. <laughs> And and uh, that becomes yeah. difficult. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just looking for their music. Right, right. Yeah, it, it, it can happen. Um, but uh, don't worry, I will provide links. Where we won't steer anyone in the wrong direction. No. Let's see. So in a 2016 interview with Noisy, <clears throat> John Reese was interviewed and he reflected on the album in the wake of the band's reunion because they you know, obviously reunited uh, briefly. Uh, he says... I think the second record holds up pretty well. I think because we recorded it in the way that we did and we spent so much time working on the record and thinking about it. For me, the wince potent is really low in comparison to all of the records that I made during that time. There's always going to be something that doesn't sit well and you have to wait 20 years for those things to happen, either sometimes literally the day or the week after, like, why did I do that? There's always those moments, but listening to Yank Crime again in preparation for getting the band back together and playing those songs again, I was really surprised. I was like, man, this really sounds great. And I'm really looking forward to doing this. End quote. So uh, so what can you say about the process for recording your new album, All Night Blood? The process was intense. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, shortly after we finished our EP that came out last year, we, we immediately started writing. And, and the plan was, oh, let's just use this EP as a step off point to a full length. And we, you know, we started cataloging riffs you know i call it the, the riff catalog you know we, we would jam come up with parts record them hold on to them maybe they weren't right maybe it wasn't a song it wasn't going to develop um and then and then it kind of just dragged on and we hit a point where we're like i think we have enough material for an album so we started dissecting and putting things together and demoing here in our rehearsal studio and booked the studio time and and i think we were like you know let's focus a lot of time on on recording let's let's get this right let's let's give everybody room to breathe um so many times in the past especially with punk and hardcore bands it was oh we've, we've got an album to record okay so we're going to do two days to record it and a day to mix it or a day to record and a day to mix it it's a very rushed you get what you get um which which is cool and there's an energy and there's a passion that's associated with that that some amazing records were made rushed and under and with no budget um but i was like we have the opportunity to spend some time in the studio um maybe develop some of the songs in the studio add to them build build some density and kind of get what we hear in our heads onto the actual record um so i think i think you know we, we spent we spent about a month and a half in the studio not not every day but two three days a week few nights a week um and and really got to kind of dig in on a granular level without compromising our original intent um but it was you know oh let's rework this part let's add to this let's embellish this guitar part to make it sound bigger let's um let's add some synth here let's add some string pads um to, to kind of build this up but let, let's not make it overwhelming because we still want to produce the same sound live um and that, that was cool auxiliary percussion something i've never done um our, our drummer and our vocalist did a dual drum part um added other percussion instruments it, it was it was really fun um maybe the length of time was a little strenuous uh for some of us mm -hmm. uh I would say, especially with vocals, we we piece the vocals together 
over multiple days as to not burn out our vocalist Ian. Oh, yeah. So rather rather than just booking a couple of days to record vocals, we'd book partial days so he could go and focus on one song and burn out his voice on that one song rather than, you know, getting through three songs and then he's, he's done and we can't do any more. Um, so that, that was, that was good. And it, it gave him a chance to drill into the lyrics and, and make sure everything felt right. And he, and it was, was placed right. Um, so that, that was, that was, you know, a great experience. Um, the immediate response when I listen to the mix, you know, you always, as a musician, I think you always listen to your own recorded music under a microscope. That's not reality. So I let it sit for a while, step back, then went and listened to it. And it was like, okay, this, I think we conveyed what we wanted to. Okay. Cool. But it, it's, 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 it's hard to see it that way because we, we hear, you know, Oh, I, I heard a, a squeak in my string right there that no one on earth is going to hear. Well, there's going to be somebody that's going to hear it, but, um, you know that, that 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 kind of stuff. I think I think musicians become very overly critical of. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, that's great. I mean, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, it sounds. And like I don't it. say that from. I don't say that from like a a, a cocky standpoint. You know, it, but it's it's just, it's it, that's just the honest truth. I'm I'm extremely grateful for 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 the the guys I'm playing with and uh, and 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 what we did. And then you know, I guess I guess looking back, it's like. Oh yeah, there were there were probably some times where I pushed people too hard, you know, like uh, retakes, like oh we need to get in this day, we need to get in this day, we need to do more, um, and that that becomes stressful, and then and, and you know, a lot of art comes from stress. Right. Sure. Sure. Well, I mean, you know, like you like you already described how the recording process went. You guys obviously took a lot of time, so it's not like I'm expecting that there was going to be any disastrous things about the recording i mean it i i listened to it and i think it sounds great so um yeah any, think, any of the any of the disasters any of the disasters we were able to of course correct in the studio because we had that extra time yeah. um you know we we had we had a couple equipment failures a couple we need to rethink how we're what amps we're using um but but we we weren't we weren't the pressure wasn't on to no you gotta do it right now just make it work right yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah, well, when you have the privilege of time, I mean, you definitely clean up everything that you can, you know. So that, that's that makes sense. Um, so now we were talking a little bit about this earlier, but uh, in comparing the first album and the second album of Drive Like Jehu, um, I know that multiple band members of Jehu have cited Slint's Spiderland as uh, as a major influence on helping them feel more comfortable in incorporating more dynamics into the music, which is obviously, you know like you were saying like yang crime is very much a departure from where the first album was um so they are doing more noises lengthening out parts um are there any other albums that you could point to that you think may have helped inform the direction of your new record of our new record yeah i think i think with the band always we we tried to focus on the 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 music that held true from our youth being the 90s um and then I, I if i if i cite bands that that influenced us i don't think they necessarily translated into the songs to where we sound like a facsimile of them but you know obviously i think helmet was a big one uh mm -hmm. jawbox unwound you know and then, and then there's things like smashing pumpkins you know we we we, we hear or sound garden you know we we hear these these things and it's like oh that riff kind of sounds like it could have been maybe adjacent to Soundgarden and we're like, that's the Soundgarden part. And it's not, and no one's going to hear it, but you know, you're able to add your own twist. Um, right. So, I mean, I mean, the influence is, you know, I, I, I know we're as a band, we spend a lot of time chit chatting at our rehearsals and, and discussing either nostalgia or what we're interested in or new music we've heard. Um, so we, we always keep that dialogue open. And I think that's constantly, causing other members to go and listen to listen to things or revisit records you know um there's there's a band called link l-y-n-c they they were pacific northwest indie emo-ish band in the 90s and and there's a lot of uh melodies and a lot of the way the bass lines work that that probably influenced me 
quite a bit because I, I know there was a period when we were writing where I was revisiting that band and listening to them. Um, you know, a lot of the mid nineties post hardcore emo music, um, a lot of the Southern California scene, um, bands like, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to reference, uh, you know, some, some bands that might be obscure to a lot of people, but like torches to Rome, Yafet Kodo, um, you know, bands, Southern California to the Bay area that were, were putting out these very emotionally driven records that had a lot of dynamic shift between jangly guitars and ferocious hardcore riffs. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's really an eclectic mix of, of influence. Okay, cool. So another thing that was interesting to me was that uh, it seems to me that the conception of Jay Who uh, came from two bands that were fans of each other uh, and, you know, both bands breaking apart at around the same time and then eventually finding each other and, uh, you know, knowing each other like were great musicians and amazing at what they did mm -hmm. and managed to kind of get together and, and create this new band. Um, so did Common Wounds have a similar kind of background? Yeah, I mean, um, the, the the core of the band was me and Ian, who's the singer vocalist, uh, the vocalist guitar player. Um, he was in a band called Run With The Hunted. They were a melodic hardcore band um, that was active, you know, in the mid to mid 2000s, um, toured a lot, put out uh, an album, toured the U.S. multiple times, toured Europe. Um, and then me with Landmine Marathon, we were touring quite extensively and we'd, we'd talked in the past about doing, doing a band based on some of those nineties influences. Um, and then this dates back to, I think our first conversation was probably 2013, 2014. Um, and both of our bands wound down weren't act as active or ceased. Um, and we started talking a little bit more seriously and it was like, let's do a band without any pretext, without any pressure. Um, because when you're in an active touring band, that's, that's working these release cycles. There's, there's a lot of pressure. There's a, a lot of pressure to produce and to be active, go on tour. And both of our lives had started to change a little bit uh, with family and career and it was like, well, let's let's do this on our own terms. Like, you know, we don't we don't have to go on a multiple month tour cycle, but we we can we can do this in a way that's that's comfortable for everybody, and just make music that we like and see if we find audience, see if people are interested. Okay. So yeah, it was it was definitely definitely two active musicians that maybe became wanted to become a little bit less active. Yeah. And what about the other guys in the band? They came from other bands too, right? Yes. So um, our drummer, Steve, uh, he relocated to Phoenix from San Jose, California uh, during the pandemic. And we found him on Craigslist, which is notoriously the worst place to find a musician or a roommate or anything. Um, and he, he put this ad out and it, it, hit a lot of the post hardcore influence, you know, obviously a lot of the DC bands, you know, Fugazi and Quicksand. Um, and, and then, and then, you know, I was like, let's, let's, let's write this guy and see if he, he might be interested in it. And it just immediately gelled. It was that, that, that musical language. He was able to, we showed him some riffs and he started playing. We're like, yeah, we don't need to tell you what the part needs. You, you understand what we're trying to convey. Um, and then our guitarist, Corey, um, played in a, a band called Seas Will Rise. Um, that was a band that was fronted by another former member of my band, Landmine Marathon. So there was a family uh, history there um, yeah. and knew him for years. And, and he he kind of, uh, you know, brings a different dynamic in his, in his guitar playing. Um, and it just it just all kind of gelled cool okay so yeah it was like because i think the thing that i was thinking about was how <clears throat> these guys uh in pitchfork and night soil man night soil man 
where yes. San Diego bands and San Diego very much had a scene at that time. These guys were obviously very much a part of it. Like, so I was curious if like the members of the your band and the previous bands they were in were also kind of like part of this Phoenix scene. That yeah, had. yeah, definitely. I've I've known I've known with, with the exception of our drummer who's a, a recent Arizona transplant. Um, mm -hmm. The other guys I've known for. 20 years 15 20 years yeah um our bands played together uh run with the hunted would play landmine marathons record release shows you know we, we definitely had a, a long history and um i think that was all related to all being adjacent in that hardcore scene um and then and then you know in talking to ian um before we even knew each other, it was like, oh, you were at this DIY show in 1995? Oh yeah, I was there too. Oh, we crossed paths at a show that probably 25 people were at and didn't even know, you know, and didn't even know each other. So it was it was uh, some small world stuff that uh, that worked itself out. Right, yeah, well, that's what those scenes do, you know I mean? And that's, why, that's what makes it kind of a scene, right? Is that all of you kind of, even if you don't know each other at the time, that's how you kind of get to, to know each other. Definitely, definitely. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge uh, social experiment in uh, uh, forced communication, I guess. Um, you know, just the situation makes us makes us have to talk to each other because we're part of this this thing that's small enough of a microcosm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's great. I mean, it's you know, and it's also thankful that you guys were able to do it. That you guys managed to to figure out, you know, putting yourselves into a room with each other and then then you know getting creative definitely it's a weird unique experience it, it is <clears throat> all right so i'm going to try to get through some of these songs uh, i'm going to skip a couple but we're going to start with the first one here come the rome plows uh rome plows were large specifically modified armored bulldozers used in south vietnam by the united states military during the vietnam war yes and, and i and, and i think i i only knew this in the past 10 years and I, th I think at one point years ago i was i was on the internet searching i'm like are they talking about roman soldiers and you know no no it's it's it was interesting and it's it's you know i i think i think those guys are similar age brackets to us maybe a couple a few years older um i i we're we're the we're all the product of the vietnam war our parents lived through the vietnam war and then there's a lot of interesting imagery and stories re related to to wartime um especially that war you know uh so i thought i thought that was pretty interesting that that was that was the the source of that title yeah yeah i mean like and it's effective and like i can't say for certain like what lyrically rick was getting at with this i mean i think association wise it's definitely like anxiety inducing it's kind of chaotic it's obviously like mm -hmm. you know really powerful um but no real idea of like if it was specifically like a like a you know anti-war song or something like that like just his his <clears throat> his lyrical choices are, are are very strange in that regard like we were talking about earlier how it's just like it, it's very open to interpretation um yeah very very abstract um but it, but it's definitely it's definitely powerful here come the rome plows it just sounds like some sort of epic force or machine coming through right especially the way he delivers it at that point like for like kind of that chorus you know yeah very powerful um i did hear mark trombino the drummer say that this was what he considered uh, his most fun song to play so i was wondering which which song or songs off your new album do you consider the most fun to play the the title track all night blood that that one um came together at the last minute it's a little bit different than the other songs on on the record but there's just something that's ignorant and impactful about that song um it's 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 that that emotional outlet it's uh you know that that one that one sticks out um mile markers become very very fun to play live um at the beginning i think we all doubted that song and we're questioning whether it fit the album because it 
not only lyrically, but musically, it, it seems like it has a little bit more of a bright, positive spin to it. Um, whereas a lot of the other songs definitely, I feel, have a little bit more of a darker theme. Um, but again, a very fun song to play locking in with my drummer. Um, I, I would say those, those are probably two of my favorite. Um, and, and we're still fleshing out some of the songs for, you know, for live performance. Um, because some of the, some of the last batch of songs were written specifically for the studio. And then we're like, we'll sort them out and get them, get them up to speed for live. Um, but yeah, I think those are the ones that, that really shine for me. Okay. Cool. Uh, let's move on to do you compute. Uh, again, kind of, kind of hard to figure out what's happening here with the song. Uh, along with my research, found nothing about the recording process. So a lot of this is kind of my own interpretation on, on lyrics. <clears throat> um, standout lyric, I feel, is, uh, is don't need a tour of the pieces I'm missing. It's kind of like the thing that kind of grabbed me the most. Yeah, it, see, it seems like um, that song lyrically is directed at a person obviously it's it seems like it's it's a it's a a communication to somebody there's there's something that he needed to say to the recipient of that song yeah. um yeah no I, I that's that's a great song and the you know, the 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 intro is uh piercing and maybe a bit excessive you know it's repetitive that 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 beginning guitar rift it's high riff is high pitch and and uh kind of drones and hypnotizes um i, I guess that would be an overall statement for that song to me it's it's very hypnotic hmm. yeah okay I, I can agree with that um also I, I guess like with this album being a predecessor to what has become emo um this could be example of like lyrically some like very emotional subject matter you know obviously it's not clear what it is exactly but there's something there that's that's very kind of personal and, and uh, evocative i think um but i was curious like where, where, where like where do you stand on emo currently i mean i think every every theme becomes a theme park as they say um i feel that when we look at the origins of emo post hardcore bands like rights of spring embrace that dc scene it was mm -hmm. very much a reaction to the machismo of hardcore and right. it was it was you know the personal becomes political we're, we're we're not we're not singing about burning down the system we're singing about personal struggles and it was very raw and honest um and i think that that maintains especially on an underground level the um i think a lot of the themes got co-opted into pop music which a lot of it's not bad um but i still think that there's very tortured lyricists that are connecting with their emotions and providing you know honest writing about real experiences and then i it's it's that slippery slope of it just becoming a sappy feel sorry for me love song um which is that sincere maybe um but i think i think a lot of times when you revisit some of, of those you know breakup songs they're always they're always difficult because time heals and maybe those those are the songs that become you know a little bit cringy uh in the end um so i i think i i think there's always going to be passionate emotionally charged bands and lyricists um and i think that exists and i think there's a subset of young musicians that are embracing that that world and that history we we have a lot of i call them emo historians these, these kids that that were you know are in their teens to 20s that are digging in deep and finding demos of this band that that put out this very raw emotional like almost crying into the mic uh microphone record and they they found connection to it and then they're presenting it in the digital form to the the entire world um it's uh i i 
I was contacted on Instagram by a, a, a person who was archiving all these 90s emo bands. And he's like, hey, this band was from Arizona. Do you know them? And I'm like, oh, I, I used to jam with those guys. And I don't, I didn't even know they recorded a demo. So I reached out to one of the members. And he's like, we recorded a demo, but I, I think I sent like 10 copies to friends. And it was like a boombox recording. And, you know, so I, I think there's always an interest. And I think as quote unquote emo music becomes more polished and to the point of being like pop rock, there's going to be that hunger to find something that actually connects and touches nerves. Hmm. Okay. Very cool. Um, let's just move on to the next song, <clears throat> Golden Brown. So great song. Great song. Uh, one of the shorter ones, which is mm -hmm. uh, interesting. I, and, and, I, and I feel like that was a thing that, um, that both Rick and John kind of like when they moved on and ended up kind of like uh, forming hot snakes, that was one of the things that they were like, we just want them to be short, you know, fun songs, like just short blasts. We don't want these long drawn out things, you know? Um, so this is kind of more in that, that realm, I suppose, but, but lyrically don't think there's much here. Like, you know, um, it just leads me to like, cause it, especially with it being one of the shorter ones, it just leads me to believe that there wasn't much, real content there like i don't know if there's like you know i, I don't know if you if you kind of like look at the lyrics like the the chorus um the chorus just says i, I ain't burnt just golden brown you know and that just kind of repeats it doesn't seem yeah i i thought maybe you know since rick rick was an artist and a, and a illustrator and a painter thinking about color and art um I, I took away a little bit of, you know, brown, brown is this this dull color that's usually, you know, undesirable. It's it's not, it's, you know, it's not vibrant. It's not uh, vibrant. It's not, it doesn't stick out. It's, it's very subdued. Um, and I haven't really dug in a lot, but I thought I figured there was some sort of metaphor to, to that where he's, he's saying, I'm boring, I'm dull. That's how you see me. Um, oh. that, that's kind of, that was kind of my initial take on that. Is it was it was a reflection on maybe how how someone or people see him. Maybe yeah, a little bit of sarcasm. Hmm. Okay, I, I, I like that interpretation. I mean, um, you know, like I said, it, it's very it was very hard to find anything um, kind of uh, uh, definitive about Rick's uh, writing process. Though he did say in an interview that, you know, uh, a lot of his lyrical content kind of comes from, from fear. That it's all very fear-based. It's all very, like, you know, personal, but also from a place of, like, real uh, insecurity and fear. So that makes sense, I think. Which, which is a, a, I think that's a good uh, emotion to connect with and to vent. Um, because I think we all become self-defeating with insecurity to on one level or another. And yeah. especially in music where there's so much posturing and a lot of, you know, smoke and mirrors and talking about how great and big things are. Every musician, I don't care how successful you are, there, there's that immediate level of insecurity of what 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 uh seeking validation from strangers, what are they gonna think? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think that's something we we are all confronted with. Hmm. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. That's it's your interpretation. I like it. <laughs> cool, man. All right. Well, then let's move on. Let's move on to Luau. So I found uh, I found this quote from uh, in posttrash.com from Dan Golden, where he says, quote, it's not exactly a happy song lamenting the damage done to Hawaii in the name of ceaseless tourism. Yes. And that that's that's interesting when you know i think that's always been uh a known fact about hawaii that you know they 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 see the tourists as mainlanders and invaders um and i mean when, when we look at even recent events the 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 fires in hawaii that you know it's devastated that that region and that sustained from tourism um 
but almost to a point where where the, the people that do live there and call a home are suffering but kind of swept away to make way for tourism because it's it's such a, a monolith and such a machine in motion right yeah and then also i think you know there's a parallel maybe to their environment i mean being being in san diego san diego's uh an interesting place it's it's very much a tourist hub um you know tourist and then and then you know some of the military installations around there so it's 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 an, it's an interesting environment and you would think it's not conducive to punk rock uh to bands and somehow they've all made it work that that scene there has been great through the years you know playing shows there have always been a blast and it's it's like i think some of the impact of what's expected from that environment being tourist vacation town Mm -hmm. contrasting creates that that hunger and passion for music and for you know this this underground community yeah okay well now in your bio uh there's this this statement uh about your song mile mark uh, which says, uh, Mile Marker is a song of hope and a reminder to ourselves that we are capable of weathering the storm even when it feels like we are at our lowest. Um, yes. So I, I don't know. I felt like maybe these had similar sentiments, the, the theme behind Luau and, and maybe the theme behind Mile Marker. There's- Possibly. I mean, I think I think that's important to all of our sanity is finding that center of hope. Um you know, in, in so many aspects, we're confronted with and bombarded with negativity, um, and it's easy to get consumed. It's easy to dwell in that darkness. Um, so I, I think finding hope, and 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 maybe that hope is through positive change. Maybe it's through taking on the forces that are uh, are messing with us. Um, yeah, I, I can see parallels. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, like the, the video from Mile Marker kind of like shows scenes of like the surrounding area of like where in your like your neighborhood, I suppose. And like, I think it, had, it connects something to like the even the album artwork for for mm-hmm. uh, Blood, right? Uh, where I don't know what you would call it even. I'm not sure exactly like what to describe it as, but it's like the, there's some sense of deterioration, uh, whether that be like societal. One hundred, one hundred percent. I think I think you. Uh... You kind of hit the nail there. Um, so I, I assembled all the artwork and took all the photos um, and ba- basically visited a lot of locations in downtown Phoenix um, that are decrepit and disrepair and neglected. And, um, you know, Arizona is not that old of a state. We don't have a lot of old buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I love about visiting the East Coast is you can see an actual old building, you know, colonial new england you know it's it's amazing um and it's it's something that we're devoid of here so a hundred year old building a 70 year old building here is is old and unfortunately progress has made it to where those buildings are undesirable people don't see the value in holding on to that it's well let's just mow that down and and put up something new and modern that you know can maximize profit um, so we, we, fa- we found a lot of locations that, that either I, we, it was mainly me, me and myself and, and, uh, our guitar player, Corey, we, places that we've seen in our journeys, like, oh, that building's interesting. I wonder what the story is with that. And, uh, took photos and subsequently took video of, of some of these buildings that were falling apart. And I think it's, it's a reflection of how we sometimes put progress ahead of valuing beauty um but then there's there's also something beautiful about a building that shows its age um yeah. people that show lines on their face you know there there there's something that that shows character and maybe a, a story that either we're told or a story that we kind of fill in the blanks on yeah okay that's interesting i, I really like that um I haven't been through through Arizona very much, but I, I did go to Phoenix on one occasion and uh, in the surrounding area, I think I was also in Tucson. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, I actually took a photo 
when I was down there, which I really, really like, and I kind of like have it framed in my house. I wonder if I could actually share it with you. Oh, wow. That'd be awesome. All right. You can see my screen, huh? Yes. Well, it's right. loading. There we go. So I think this was taken outside of a, a place, and I think this may have been in Tucson. Like, what does that look like to you? Does that look like similar to, to structures in your neighborhood? or that, that that looks like that is Tucson. Um, similar to some of the buildings in downtown that are still surviving, I would say that Tucson is a little bit um, behind on the mass uh, change and tear down of buildings. They still have quite a few buildings with character and age. And, but yeah, that's, that, that's definitely similar to a lot of the, the photos that are in the album artwork. Um, you see except that for, except for, except for, except for the buildings that I shot were this building in disrepair and neglect. Yeah. Do you see that sign in the window? I can't read it, but I see it. Yeah, it's it's very small, you know, um, but it says the machines are winning. That that I, I'm sure that's Tucson. I mean, Tucson definitely has an eclectic art scene, and I, I think people that are more resistant to uh, that kind of change and are holding on to a, a lot of the culture and character of of the town. There we go. We're back. All right. Well, I just wanted to share that with you because uh, you know it's it's around your vicinity. It might not necessarily be your your you know hometown or your neighborhood, but I feel like and that was taken a long time ago. I took that two thousand four or five, maybe. Somewhere. Oh wow. So I don't know. It's yeah, been... and I, I think we still have these sections that you know I like to say the the, the place that time forgot, where it kind of sits as a time capsule. Um, and, and that's a, that's a good thing. It's just, it's just, we keep seeing less and less of that in the name of progress. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, uh, so yeah, I just wanted to share that with you because it was just so, uh, I, I knew about, you know, a little bit about the artwork for, for the album. <clears throat> and I just kind of had to even ask you about it, just kind of get an idea of like what, what is going on in the, in the, Phoenix. And, and with the artwork, obviously we have we have that yellow building that's on the front cover um, and continues to the back. But within the album, it comes with nine postcards hmm. of different locations in uh, similar states with the same blood neon sign okay. in the in the photo. Um, each one relating to a song. So they're postcards that each are somewhat thematically related to the song. So it's, it's, you know, hopefully people buy the record and they get to see the entire, uh, the entire flow of the, the physical art to the, the sonic art. Cool. That's great, man. I mean, like, that's the best part about making physical media now, right? Like, is that you can actually share a story through the artwork and not just the music. Yeah. And I think for me, it's something, you know, that was always magical about records. Yeah. You know, the artwork was big and you you pull out inserts and you know the 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 kiss record that would come with posters and catalogs for you know kiss iron ons or, yeah. or whatnot it was it was, that was always the magic to me so i i we we discussed when 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 deciding to do this lp discussed with our label and he was on board to to make it you know a cool package that 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 had a lot of uh related content Oh, man. Well, that's great. Uh, can't wait to see it. Definitely. I'll have to order it. Um, let's move on to another song. Let's see. Uh, Super Unison. Don't have anything for Super Unison or new intro, being, you know, that being an, uh, an instrumental song. Mm -hmm. So if we get down to new math, um, don't have much to say about this either, except uh, I think it's hilarious that the song is called New Math. And it's got all these weird kind of time changes in it, like not, <laughs> not sensors necessarily, but like the, the counts, like the, the measure counts are kind mm -hmm. of off. And that made me wonder if, well, my first thought was it's it's right after new intro. So I was like, are these songs related or mm -hmm. were these like the working titles, you know, because obviously before you name songs, usually most bands have like 
names that just are placeholders. So was this the the new math song because it was a new song and it was the mathy song? Yeah. Um, I don't I don't know because the, the lyrics don't really talk about mathematics or anything. No, not really. Um, and also, I, I actually well, my thought was like, well, is this kind of like maybe uh, Rick's little kind of play on words, considering. Uh, you know, Jehu was not only considered uh, like an emo band, but they were also a lot of the times uh, defined as a new, uh, as a as a math rock band. Possibly, I mean, I th I think that Identifier came after the the record. I don't even know if was was math. I guess math rock was a was a term that was used in the late in the mid nineties. Um, yeah. yeah, possibly. Maybe I'm not sure. It's all it's all a mystery to me, really. Even still, even after, but I, th I think that I think I think that the magic of the record is there was so much mystery, and there still is so much mystery. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we're not going to be cracking any codes uh, here tonight, but it's nice to to get a different, uh, you know, perspective on it too. Exactly. So that only leads me to the last two songs: "Human Interest" and "Sinews." Now, um, so let's see. This the the song human interest and then the next song sinews seem to be very much connected lyrically mm -hmm. um where where human interest says uh quote when i'm in doubt when i'm in debt when i'm in deep at your expense then i owe you i owe you i owe whereas sinews goes quote found yourself an asshole find yourself the door ain't gonna fix your leaks for you ain't gonna watch the store no more end quote um so kind of like this financial metaphor for interest in a relationship possibly that that's exactly what i i took from it is that their, their relationship songs about the investment of a, in a relationship not necessarily literal but the emotional investment and then you know sinews is is definitely the breakup song but but not in a sappy way it's it's there's some anger there's some definite anger in there there's definite betrayal and then there's dividing the assets and and we've all been through that whether it's dividing the the literal assets from a relationship or the emotional assets um yeah no i i think i think that's it okay yeah i mean uh whether the two of them actually really do have some some kind of connectivity or not i mean i'm not sure but it just seemed funny for placement and i know that i know that sinews was written well before the album um right. i think the the reissue of yank crime has the original version which was on the headhunter records compilation head start to purgatory which oh. is a good document of san diego at that time and it was a, a more primitive version of the song um but you know i've i've definitely had instances where one of my songs has influenced another um okay you know, I don't, I don't think it's ever gotten to the um, concept point of having a part one and a part two of a song, and, and maybe that was maybe that was subconscious, but I, I can see the relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, what I wanted to ask you was, uh, so now I've always considered being in a band similar to being in a relationship. Um, so I was wondering what, like, what do you think your personal interest is in being in your band? I mean, it's it's fulfilling on so many levels. There's, I've had a hard time being in bands with people that I didn't have friendships and relationships with, um, and then that happens. You know, I think a band is navigating multiple relationships and multiple personalities. Um, you learn a lot about communication. You learn a lot about when to speak and when not to speak, um, and I don't mean that in a harsh sense. But if you're in a band with four or five other people, there's a lot of tension that just naturally creates itself. And I've learned internally when it's time for me to pump the brakes, maybe I'm being too intense. Maybe I'm picking at somebody unintentionally or intentionally. Um, so yeah, bands are a working study of how we interact and coexist you know yeah i think i think there's a lot of things to learn 
from healthy band relationships that can go into romantic relationships or business relationships. You know, if you work in any kind of environment, office jobs with a team, with coworkers, you're doing that same thing. You're managing personalities, you're managing communication styles. Um, I, I think, I think it's taught me more than I ever expected in, in that regards to where I can take those experiences and those relationships and apply them to my day to day, my normal life, quote unquote, my day job. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's a magical thing. Um, there, there's so much of a band that's driven by creativity, but there's another aspect that's really fun and social. It's, it's, you know, the, 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 the bandmates become like brothers and sisters. You know, they, they, they know things about you that a lot of people don't, that everything becomes raw and open. Um, and, and that's a great thing. I mean, that's, that's something that I think a lot of people don't experience outside of one-on-one -on -one relationships. Right. Absolutely. I, I can, I can actually very much relate to that sentiment. Um, and, and like also, you know, in, in, in addition to that, it's like, what do you think uh, you bring to your band? Like, like, what is your own kind of personal interest in the band as far as it's like, you know, what is your, like, if you look at the band as like a four piece, as a quadrant, <clears throat> and like every member of the band brings something, what do you, what are you bringing? Definitely. I, I'm, I'm the strategy. I'm the person that's assessing risk and 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 whatnot like the 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 driver of the business side of things um so so i look at the 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 media connection and how we're going to try and find audience um you know other other members contribute more in the primary songwriting or you know um one of our members is a, is more of a, a character in a ham, and he makes these videos that are that bring a little bit more levity for social media. You know, he he likes to joke around and play characters, and uh, you know, it's 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 all aspects of personality, um, but it's it's just finding that 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 balance between each other. Um, you know, I I I used to in my youth I thought that bands had to run like a democracy where everybody gets an equal portion of the work and that doesn't always work you know i'm better about booking shows and, and making sure that merchandise is printed and distributed if your best ability in the band is showing up and playing your instrument with 100 percent heart and passion that's amazing. And that's, that's, that's an equal contribution, you know? Um, and I, I think, I think it took a lot, a long time to realize that. Um, and I, I think we, we have that and, and, and it's working so far. Yeah. Great, man. I mean, you know, you can't ask for more uh, in, in most situations. So, well, and I think that's why a lot of bands fall apart or lose members because everybody's so ready to go and, maybe overly passionate that their expectations of others become unrealistic or or maybe and maybe even also that they don't realize where they're where they fit in or how they fit in or or that somebody is taking on uh like a, a responsibility that they don't necessarily know how to do or they're just not they're better off letting it look like letting handing it off to somebody else right definitely and i, I think maybe that maybe that translates to all of our human interactions <laughs> Sure. I mean, it's, I mean, some people I think can be oblivious to these things. You know, this is speaking outside of uh, band relationships as well. Just like, you know, maybe you don't realize that, you know, something, somebody is really is good at something and you should just let them do that and, you know, appreciate that, that they have a special and unique talent that, you know, that's all, that's all they need to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 100%. Cool. All right, man. Well, uh, that's that wraps it up for discussing the album. Um, I've got nothing else to say about Drive Like Jehu for the moment, except uh, it was a great album. And I, I thank you for choosing it so that I could actually spend time with it and really, really 
like indulge in it in the way that I should have uh, a few years ago. Awesome. No, I appreciate it. I, I had a wonderful time talking to you and um, I know sometimes I meander in, in conversation. So I, I hope we, uh, Oh, you kept it on the rails. We got, we got, we got some points. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I appreciate your time. Um, I love this record. I hope, I hope some of uh, your audience maybe finds this as something new and, and listens to it and, and discover something from it or, find something adjacent from it. Maybe they're like, oh, this guy was in Rocket from the Crypt. I need to check out this band now. That's my favorite party rock and roll band now. You know, so it's yeah. uh it's it's all part of the uh the the journey and experience. Yeah, yeah. Well maybe they'll find out about Common Wounds as well and the, the new album, uh All Night Blood, which is being released by who's putting it out I get again? I forget. Protagonist Music. They're a label based out of Tucson. We're their one hundredth release. Oh, that's um, so this is a very so special it's a He's 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 had a, a prol- prolific schedule of releases, um, many that flew under the radar. He's committed to putting out music that he personally connects with, and I, I can't argue with that. You know, another another big fan of the band. Huh? Yes, yes, big fan. Somebody that believes in us. I'm I'm on board. Okay, and you guys are are pressing uh, vinyl for this. We're pressing vinyl. Um, the 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 death wish inc uh store is distributing the record um should be available everywhere yeah pre-orders now pre-orders now allnightblood.com that's that's the landing point yeah and the upcoming tour like what was that look like for you um so because everybody has a lot of job and family commitments we're not going to do any extensive touring the plan is to do short regional bursts meaning southern california pacific northwest east coast for a few days we're we're working out the logistics now um and try i want to try and hit some places that uh make sense without without being stuck in a van for six weeks right yes yeah i mean it seems like most people are doing it that way right now you know you know it's there there's nothing more defeating than being in a empty Midwest town on a Tuesday and playing for the sound person and the bartender. Right. It's, you know, I guess it's a rite of passage, but it's also a, a huge morale dent. I think uh, you can be strategic and make it all make sense. Yeah. Right. I, I, I completely understand, man. Um, well, I wish you the best of luck with it. Regardless, uh, I will order my copy as soon as I can. And uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time and talking with me, man. Thank you very much, Sean. I'm very grateful.